so let's move on to rituxan, uh, or anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. Um, used very often for use in ITP, not FDA approved for the indication, but uh, as Dr. McCray mentioned earlier, uh, used with good efficacy. Um, so can you describe sort of what the outcomes are with use of rituxan in the second line setting? Um, you mentioned you're bringing it up sometimes up front first line. And what I've seen in practice is, is patients getting exposed multiple times to courses of rituxan. So can you comment on what you think is, you know, evidence supported and, and what you do? Well, so there's, there's a number of ways rituxan can be used in ITP. One is which you just alluded to as, the, as a second line agent, um, perhaps a single agent. Um, and in that setting, it's reported to have a response rate of about 60 to 65 percent. Um, complete responses in maybe 20 to 30. Um, what is the duration of response? So that that's highly expect. variable, um, and and it you know it, it it does tend to I think correlate with how well the response is. As the patient does get a complete response, those patients tend to re, you know stay in remission. In my experience, and really most of the literature for you know six months, maybe nine months, maybe a year, maybe longer. I mean, if you look at a retrospective study by Patel many years ago, they reported 20 to 25 percent of patients who had remained in that complete response for one year, maintained that response for five years. So uh, I do think, uh, you know, that's, that data has been criticized. Uh, there are some other studies that have looked at the use of rituximab earlier in the course of the disease, often with high dose steroids, often with a third immunosuppressive agent for a, a fixed duration of time, okay. um, that have reported in the right type of patient, primarily women, with ITP of less than 18 to 24 months duration, mm -hmm. uh, long-term response rates as high as 60 percent. Okay. Which is so early in the course of the disease, any, a younger patient. Early in the course of the disease, a younger patient, well, not a younger patient, but particularly females seem yeah. to do better than males. Um, again, that data hasn't been reproduced um, and needs to be and needs to be studied uh, in more of a randomized manner, as do, uh, I think, uh, you know, some of the other reports, even with the TPO agents, that suggest these uh, longer. But I, I think that, mm -hmm. uh, um, I think it, it tells us uh, that whether it's rituximab or something else, you know, there, there may be ways that, that, I've always looked at ITP um, kind of like thinking we should kind of treat it like cancer. I mean, when we think about treating cancer, uh, well, now there's more and more agents, but at least in the older days, you know, you, you treated cancer, and it's still, I think, largely true. Your best chance to treat cancer is yeah. right in the beginning, yeah. and that's why people, uh, Sidney Farber and everybody else, went back all these years mixing combinations of things through different, and they treated patients hard, and they, lo and behold, found that they finally actually cured some people. And, uh, you know, ITP is, I guess, an oligoclonal disease, but... Uh, but, uh, but I think there's some evidence when you look back in the literature for evolution of ITP clones over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a rationale for these becoming more and more refractory to therapies. Uh, uh, of course, we have more and more therapies too. But uh, so I think there's, there may be a place for rituximab up, up front uh, or early in the course. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, uh, maybe, uh, TPO agents as well, and, mm -hmm. and maybe they're even better. I don't know. Um, but, but standard, uh, you can retreat. If you use it as a standard second-line therapy, particularly in the patients who respond well, can get a reasonably lengthy response, and you can often repeat it, and they can get a response that's just about as long, in, in my experience. So, so again, reasonably lengthy would be what? Six, nine months, okay. maybe 12. I mean, they're not going to, you know, if they're at 200, they may start drifting down at five months or six months, but yeah. they may not need retreatment for nine to 12 months, uh -huh. and then they can get retreatment, and they might do well for another nine to 12 months. So, so you so find it reasonable to give a second course of rituxan upon relapse if the duration has been six to nine months. After that second course of rituxan, if you get a shorter duration of response, is it reasonable to again retreat, or how do you how do you gauge what to do after the second course? Well, you know, if the responses are getting shorter and shorter, you mm -hmm. sit down and have a talk with the patient and just say, you know, this 
this bot basically allows you to go for maybe two years yeah. and not have to take medication every day or every week. Yeah. Uh, and you were, could live a normal life with taking no medicines mm -hmm. and, and we're quite happy. And you know, we got some mileage out of that and you know, we have diminishing returns now. So yeah. you know, it's probably time to think about other things. And what risks do you feel there are to rituxan in this really benign disease? Um, and what do you talk with the patients about? I actually, my opinion and experience is that rituximab is actually quite safe. I mean, there's of course the first infusion reaction mm -hmm. that, that everyone knows about. Um, I think that's, you know, uncommon and, yeah. and, and even less common if you pre-medicate with steroids and things. But that's something you do have to deal with. I mean, I've had a, a few patients, a couple patients, have serum sickness with rituximab, um, which was really unusual. Um, but that's that's something to be aware of. Um, you know, it is an immunosuppressive drug. If you look carefully, um, there is, uh, you know, there's probably a slight increase in infections in these patients. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks about PML. Mm -hmm. There's been one case, maybe two cases of PML in patients who received rituximab along with all kinds of other immunosuppressives and steroids and everything else for years and years who had lupus. Um, so there is a theoretical risk of PML yeah. uh, with rituximab, but, but I, I, I think that that's uh, you know, not something that's a major concern, I'd say.